welcome to this week's edition of History Now. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Brian Hanley, who's here to speak about his new book on the impact of the Troubles in the Republic of Ireland. You're very welcome, Brian. Thank you. I just want to maybe just take you back four or five years here. I saw you in Galway and it seemed that your uh, book, your idea for this book, even then, was pretty well developed. Uh, can I ask you what the, you know, your, your reason for um, writing this book, the, the sort of genesis of it? Thanks very much, first of all, for, for having me on, Barry. Um, it really was a combination of, of a lot of work I'd done over the years on republicanism, where I'd always come back to this question of how important was Southern Ireland or the Free State or the Republic of Ireland to the Republican movement, even from, from partition onwards. You know, there's always a Republican movement there, and, and how much of their effort was, was either stymied or facilitated by the fact that they operated from a different state to the one which ultimately by the 1950s they were concentrating on, on overthrowing. And then secondly, it really was personal in that I'm basically the same age. I was born in 1969, so when I was a child and when I was a teenager, uh, growing up in, in, in initially near Drogheda and then most of the time in Limerick, the North was always a backdrop. It was always there. Um, I, I have like snatched memories of, of conversations between adults about arguments, about hearing people, you know, having rows in pubs, the news, the radio, names, you know, some of the earliest kind of terms I can remember, the Miami, I can remember my parents really reacting very emotionally after the Miami Showband massacre. I remember the Herma kidnapping, again, because uh, Tate Herma was boss of a, a factory in Limerick. And I remember hearing the terms the Little Johns and, and in my own mind confusing that with, with Robin Hood and, and things like that. But by 1980-81, I understood a little bit more and, and that was the time when the, the hunger strikes uh, were, beginning, uh, were beginning and had a big impact in terms of, of every day, even in school, uh, you know, at, at lunchtime, mock riots and stuff like that from what you'd so seen on television the night before. I mean, a very, you know, I mean mock, not, mm -hmm. not, not proper riots, but you were copying what you were seeing. So it didn't surprise me when I became a historian and when I began to write in history that the standard accounts of the Republic in the 1970s all kind of said the North wasn't a big deal. That really, aside from a few passing moments in the beginning, 69 maybe to 72 or, or even less, that it didn't have much of an impact. Whereas to me, it seemed to have to seem to be a constant presence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at the beginning of your book, you, you mentioned the likes of sort of political revisionism in terms of what Bertie Ahern was saying about the, the, uh, the burning of the British Embassy after Bloody Sunday and things like that. There seemed to be a perspective that just didn't reflect reality. One thing that I do, do remember from when you were in Galway speaking, that there were people who had, did have the view that it didn't have such much of an impact. So like, how, do you think that was pretty widespread? Well, I mean, I think if you read John A. Murphy, historian based in Cork, very uh, popular um, historian in the 1970s, 1980s, he publishes a book in the mid-1970s where es essentially he says, aside from the emotional upsurge after Bloody Sunday in 1972, the North hasn't really affected mm. the, the uh, Republic. Then in the mid-1980s, Ronan Fanning from UCD, again, very much a, a, um, a historian who'd be a public face, you know, would feature on television, radio debates and so on. He argues in his book on modern Ireland that again, aside from a couple of years in the early 70s, this hasn't been a big issue in, in, in Southern politics. Now, both of those men spent an enormous amount of time discussing and arguing about the North. And it, it seemed to me to be strange that they were asserting that it wasn't a big issue when in a whole series of ways, it, I think it profoundly affected life in Southern Ireland. And Maybe we can talk about those ways, but certainly it didn't seem to me to reflect, you know, the reality as I remembered it or as even a cursory look at any of the Irish newspapers throughout the 1970s would, would suggest. Yeah, it's strange because five years ago again, you know, you had the anniversary of De Valera's passing, the 40th anniversary of De Valera's passing, and I heard some talk about then, you, you know, he was um, very fearful of the spread of civil mm. war to the, the, um, the South. You talk, you've mentioned briefly in your book about people voicing those fears of, of civil war. At the time, was that a widespread belief that this could happen? Yeah, by the winter of 1971. I mean, initially after 1969, and we were coming up to that anniversary, I mean, the, there was a big emotional 
a wave of solidarity with northern nationalists and that expressed itself again in after the say the falls curfew particularly after internment and it would in its its biggest form express itself after bloody sunday but in the winter of 1971 as as things began to get worse in the north and obviously after internment the level of violence increases to a great extent you began to see people trade unionists politicians from all the, the three parties from Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and Labour commentators begin to talk about this drift you know the spread of, of, of conflict the potential fear of it spilling over northern politicians Ivan Cooper you know came to Sligo and gave a speech there and, and in his speech he mentioned this isn't just an issue for us if this goes on it's going to spill over here too and you could have civil war in your streets and then on Christmas Day 1971 on RTE Cardinal William Conway, the head of the Catholic Church in Ireland, gave the Christmas message. And his Christmas message was about, essentially, the, his fear that violence was going to spread. And he says, all of us on this island are at the moment worried about what's happening in the north. But he said, you know, you're in Dublin, you think things are peaceful. There's a boiling volcano mm. of potential violence underneath you, and this could spread. And again, the fact that somebody as, as public and as senior a figure in the, the church, Catholic Church hierarchy was saying that, reflects that these fears were being expressed. Now again, retrospectively, you can have an argument about whether or not that was ever a reality. There's a whole range of reasons why the conflict would never be the same in the South as it was in the North. But certainly by 1971, the first Garda in over 30 years had been killed in the line of duty during a bank robbery. You know, people were being shot in the South for the first time, again, since the 1940s, really. And they'd been a little during the border campaign, but during the border campaign, the IRA had fairly much restricted its activities to the North. Now you had gone from a situation where bank robberies were unknown to them happening once or twice a day, ultimately by 1972. And again, not all of them were connected to the North, but the perception was that they were. I mean, the perception was that all this was increase in violence, increase in uh, presence of the Irish army on the streets. Because remember, that the Gardaí were largely unarmed. Very quickly, the army were being called on to help with checkpoints for public order. Um, most people in the South are probably unaware that CS gas and rubber bullets have been used by the Irish army in 1972, 1973, during riots and demonstrations in, in the South. By the time I was a child, and certainly by the time I was a teenager, Soldiers outside banks, military escorts for cash in transit and all those things were just part of day-to-day -day life. Now, that's unusual. I mean, that doesn't happen in Britain. The British Army doesn't guard secure car. Whereas in Southern Ireland, we just got used to the fact that that was the case. And that was because of the North and the way that the Southern state ultimately tried to, to balance this new situation with the fact that it didn't want to, to arm the Gardaí to a great extent. And it didn't want... To. Of course, there's a whole, then a whole series of laws either reintroduced or brought in, which also are a response to, to that conflict too. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, the very important, you know, the, the Christmas Day message. Um, in terms of television, um, when this uh, conflict broke out, there, in, your, in your book you look at, there seemed to be a massive confusion in RTAs, how, how they would handle this, who, who they would give a platform to, who to speak, things like that there. Could you tell us about that there? And do you think that was this utter confusion um, result out of this is the first time there was a massive conflict with this new medium mm -hmm. uh, at the backdrop of it in, in Ireland? Yeah, I mean, firstly, the impact of television can't be underestimated because in October, 5th of October 1968, Derry was brought into living rooms and, and pubs and, and so on across the south because of RT. I mean, they'd been batting charges in the 40s and 50s, you know, that were talked about. But this, again, television was played a big role in how the North became very immediate to a lot of people in the South. And initially there is a great deal of confusion how to deal with it because during the border campaign, form of censorship, Section 31 of the Broadcasting Act, had been introduced to essentially bar those calling for armed violence or armed overthrow of the state from the airwaves. But it hadn't been used very much then. I think Sinn Féin were prohibited from having a, an election broadcast in the 1961 general election. But in 1968, 1969, there's a lot of confusion about exactly who's allowed on and who's not. RTE were also at loggerheads from the late 60s with the Fianna Fáil government. Fianna Fáil and RTE were on a kind of collision course. Fianna Fáil felt RTE had been infiltrated by subversives. 
you know, as early as 1969, mm. they're complaining about left wingers and Republicans who are working in RTE. They don't like the tone of RTE's coverage of things like housing protests in Dublin. So Fianna Fáil are, are kind of um, itching to have a go at RTE. And there's this constant, you know, to and fro of, of public kind of um, complaints about why was, you know, somebody from the Communist Party on television, you know, who do they represent, you know, there's this kind of wariness of this medium and, and its subversive impact. So when the conflict begins to grow, you immediately have a battle beginning with the Fianna Fáil government initially and with RTE about what can be shown and what cannot be shown. And RTE does initially interview IRA leaders, like Carl Goulding and Sean McStephon. It interviews people from Sinn Féin. It interviews a variety of opinion and the Fianna Fáil government begin to complain, complain both privately and publicly very loudly about this by 1971. Um, so ultimately by 1972, Section 31 is being enforced more rigidly. Um, and I suppose ironically, again, because we all look at these things with the benefit of hindsight, if you ask anybody who's, anybody who's, who's familiar with the history of Section 31 and so on, They'll have invariably mention Conor Cruz O'Brien. They'll very talk, invariably talk about the coalition government of the mid-70s and their record. But in 1971-72, Conor Cruz O'Brien and Gareth Fitzgerald and others are critical of Fianna Fáil's attempts at censorship. Their view at the time is that the best way to discuss these things is let everybody have their point of view and air them. Some people argue that any time, you know, an IRA spokesperson comes on, they're often not very credible and as things are getting worse, they're finding it hard to, to justify what they're doing. And that's better than not having them on. But Fianna Fáil are arguing that we, by mid-1972, we've now got a situation where people are being killed on a regular basis. In the government's view, these people are also attempting to subvert the South and we can't give them a platform. And you and RTE had better stop giving them a platform or else. And ultimately, it's, it's Jack Lynch's government that sacks the RTE authority jails a reporter for refusing to hand over a tape of an interview he'd done with Sean McSteve Fawn and are seen at the time as a government that are really out to control RTE. If, if I can just go on to, it's pretty much at the beginning of the, of the Troubles as well, the influx of refugees. Can you tell us about the, the, the sort of refugee situation there? And if you see any parallels with what happened in 1922? Well, initially, yeah, I mean, there's, firstly, in 1969, the overwhelming public mood in the South is, is of sympathy with Northern nationalists. And probably around a thousand come South, um, mostly from Belfast, but not always from Belfast. People from, from rural areas move too, particularly in the mid-August when there's this fear of what's going to happen next. And about 700 of them are, are put up by the Irish Defence Forces in places like Gormanstown in County Meath. And others then are either looked after by contacts they have in the south like a couple of hundred people from Anderson's town end up going to Mullingar and that's through a personal contact initially and then other church bodies um, and and charitable agencies agree to take people as well so about 50 kids from Ardoyne come to Limerick stay in Limerick for a couple of weeks and the mood in 1969 initially is, is anything we can do and the Limerick leader I think says give until it hurts you know collect money for these people give money to the Red Cross um, local businesses take, give free food and, and, and clothing. There's free trips to the cinema, free trips to Butlins Holiday Camp, which is near Garmin's town as well. Um, tr free trips to Dublin Zoo. And there's a great deal of sympathy with the people who'd fled. And a lot of those people go back relatively quickly. By 1970, there's still a few dozen families, I think, in Gorman's town. And you're already beginning to see some reports kind of saying that these are people who, who don't really fit in and have got some kind of problems and how long are we going to keep looking after them. But that then is submerged in July 1970 in the period after riots in Ballymurphy, then the uh, violence in the Short Strand and then the Falls curfew. People come south again. So again, they're looked after primarily by the defence forces. And you also then have charities, a whole variety of different agencies, both Catholic, Protestant and so on, who begin to set up schemes whereby children could come south for a couple of weeks during the summer. And this becomes a phenomenon right throughout the 70s of kids from Belfast and elsewhere being given holidays um, in the south. The biggest influx is July 1972. And that's the most fraught because 
they come in the worst month of the worst year of the conflict or people didn't know that then I mean if you ever talked about it becoming a civil war it looks like that's going to happen in July 1972 so you got over 10,000 people flee south and by this stage you're beginning to see an increase in wariness about the refugees um, privately the civil service are saying a lot of these people are not coming because they're afraid they're coming because they know if you go to um, Great Victoria Street Station and you say you're a refugee and you want to go south you were put in a train to Dublin you got off the other side with your voucher you know you were then accommodated in Dublin and basically civil servants argue that these people are coming here for a free holiday and that they're actually bringing suitcases they're bringing you know they're they are not people fleeing violence now that seems remarkable given that Belfast in July 1972 saw a whole series of, of horrific incidents you know um, and that really the idea that people were simply packing their bags and looking for a free holiday in the south um, is incredulous but it, it does show a certain attitude but also then that's expressed publicly because what also begins to happen is that and this is you know somewhat similar to today in some ways as long as the people from the north accepted what they were given and appeared grateful people tended to be very sympathetic towards them but by July 1972 some of the people who arrived say these places are dirty there's no facilities for our kids the food here is terrible as soon as they complain the attitude is these people are not really refugees these people are ungrateful and then you begin to see a kind of litany of complaints about teenagers are are violent and unruly they've got no respect for the Gardaí they're demanding our attention and demanding our support but they're causing trouble everywhere they go and in the mid 70s their fears again of civil war and their preparations are made and a lot of the civil servant um, you know the, what they were talking about in the mid 70s is that from our last experiences this could be really a problematic influx in one senior guard that compares it to the Palestinians in Lebanon mm -hmm. says if there's a civil war in the north and we have thousands of people coming south they are going to be potentially a very grave threat to the state because as quite apart from politics a lot of these youngsters are coming from areas where the, there's no rule of law and they're mm -hmm. not going to accept our rule of law either so you know he's talking in terms of, of this as a a really catastrophic situation now that doesn't come to pass but again it shows you how attitudes had shifted within yeah. a, a relatively short period period of time in terms of when violence does come across the border you have Cavan and Monaghan uh, especially it highlights you know the Protestant communities who were on the other side of partition in 1922 the murder of Billy Fox the Fine Gael senator how did that first of all change public opinion in that area and in the south and then when you get on to you know what the likes of did ha happen the monaghan dublin uh, bombings the first violence certainly the first fatality is a loyalist killed by loyalists killed by his own bomb um, thomas mcdool is killed trying to bomb the esb station in ballyshannon in october 1969 and loyalists are responsible for around half the deaths in the south um, and again as early as 1970-71, loyalists are bombing targets in Dublin, symbolic targets like the Daniel O'Connell Tower in Glasnevin or the statue of Wolf Tone at, in, in Stephen's Green and Wolf Tone's grave, Bowden's town. And then by 1972, fire bombings, a lot of them are kind of mysterious, you know, and again, there's all, all kinds of theories about these things, but certainly by the winter of 1972, the loyalists are bombing in border areas, in Donegal, then in Monaghan as well, and also then targeting... Dublin um, in December 1972 there's car bombs in Dublin which cause a great deal two deaths hundreds of injuries huge amount of damage and from 72 to 75 bombs and bomb scares are a regular thing in the border counties in County Louth as well and and uh, and in Dublin and occasionally elsewhere as well I mean loyalists ultimately bomb hotels in Limerick and, and Ross Lair and places too the deadliest bombings are in Monaghan and in Dublin um, but there are, are other bombings in those years as well, up till 1977, actually. Um, the bomb in Castle Blaney in 1976, in which a man is killed, a car bomb as well. And so they're a constant kind of backdrop. And they're always then tied up with the idea that, you know, how are the loyalists able to operate? Who's helping them? Is anybody helping them? The UVF didn't claim the Dublin Monaghan bombs. 
of May 1974, the worst bombs. They didn't claim those until the 1990s, so for a long period there wasn't any, you know, even official claim of responsibility. Um, and that violence does also impact on border communities. I mean, certainly Cavan Monaghan and Donegal, prior to partition, had large Protestant populations, um, diverse Protestant mm. populations, Presbyterian, Anglican and so on, had been a centre of organisation for the Ulster Volunteer Force, you know, and those unionists were left behind by partition. Mm. And that's not that long before 1969. So again, there were people who'd predated partition who were still alive, you know, and in the rest of Ireland then you had a Protestant minority who in the popular mind were always kind of seen as middle class or privileged and so on. It was more diverse than that. In Donegal, for example, you know, lots of Protestant mill workers and so on. You still had the remnants of a Protestant working class in, in Dublin and elsewhere, but, you know, who were kind of seen as, as a little bit apart. Um, and the, the violence in the North suddenly brings these questions back of, hadn't Protestants always been on the British side? You know? mm. So in, 1960, in August 1969, when the news is all about what's happening to the Catholics in Belfast, somebody firebombs a Presbyterian church in Arklow and Wicklow. Somebody puts a petrol bomb into a Protestant-owned shop in Enniscorthy in Wexford. You know, because somebody thinks that our people are under attack in the mm. North and it's their people who are doing it. Um, and that had happened in 1935 yeah. during the Belfast riots. There'd been a whole scale of anti-Protestant incidents. So again, there's a historical precedent, but most people are obviously horrified by that. But in the border counties, there's an orange tradition. The Orange Order had been crossing over to go to parades, you know, in, in Rossnaula and Donegal. Um, that parade, which is always, you know, regarded as the friendly parade mm. that everybody tolerates. It doesn't happen from between 1970 and 1979 because in 1970, Senator Bernard McGlinchey, who's a local Fianna Fáil senator, says, these are the people who burnt the people out of their homes. These are the people who caused trouble for our brethren, so they shouldn't be allowed march. So there's a big controversy about whether you tolerate the Orange Order in, in those places. So the, these questions re-emerge, and I suppose the... The worst example of that re-emergence is, is the murder of, of, of Billy Fox, who's elected a TD in 1969, um, is a Fine TD, a farmer, Church of Ireland background, very popular, um, seen as a nationalist. You know, he goes to the bog side in August 1969, probably loses a little bit of Protestant support in Monaghan because he, he's... He's seen as a nationalist. Another occasion he's thrown out of the doll because he brings in a, a rubber bullet that had been fired across the border by British troops. And, and he says to Fianna Fáil TDs, we'll see which side you're on now of, of Irishmen or the British Army. And Fianna Fáil's response is then t to call him a B special Republican and to say that, you know, um, there's something strange about you being a nationalist. So all those kind of questions, which at a local level could be poisonous, mm. are kind of in the air. Um, and by 1973, 74, in the border areas, there had been a good deal of suspicion that were loyalists being given some assistance by Protestants on the southern side of the border. You'd also have the IRA operating in those counties, both locally and people who'd, who'd come across the border. Lots of worries about who's talking to the police, who's doing this. And there's essentially a rumour spread that there's arms being stored at a farm where a family called the Coulsons lived and Fox was going out. He'd lost his seat in the general election. He was a senator by this stage. He's going out with a woman called Marjorie Coulson. And one night the IRA raid the farm, demand that they know where these arms are, um, and they end up burning the farmhouse and the, the, the Coulsons' caravan. Um, Fox arrives in the midst of this and is shot and he dies. And it, there's a huge confusion initially about who does it. The impact of that is is... At a local level, there's a lot of disgust and unease and, and anger. But at a national level, by this stage, Fine Gael and Labour are in power. They've got a very confrontational attitude now with Republicans. Um, all their concerns about civil liberties, which they've been voicing fairly regularly under Fianna Fáil, go out the window once they're in power. Um, and their case that this state is facing an existential threat from the IRA seems to be made by the fact that this is the first killing of a politician since Kevin O'Higgins. In the, in the south. So the backdrop of all this happened, you have a very strong uh, union representation which manifests itself in a number of ways. If we can start just by you know mentioning that and then mention you know how sort of to wrap things up about 
the the print media of the time and how that you know has informed how how you've went and looked at this and how, could you say something about how that's um, been overlooked? One of the, I suppose the most common forms of, of popular protest after Bloody Sunday, for example, was strike action, um, and particularly unofficial strike action, and that kind of reflects that. In the 1970s, the majority of workers in the Republic of Ireland were in trade unions, and that there was still, in the 1960s, the Republic had topped the European strike levels. Um, in the 1970s, there was still a great willingness to, to take industrial action, and you know, trade union leaders themselves complained about the fact that picket lines were essentially sacrosanct. If somebody put up a picket, other people wouldn't pass it. So you find, you know, after Bloody Sunday, and then, Again, in protests against different forms of government legislation, you often have a, a fairly widespread level of, of industrial action. And I think that reflects the Times as well as the North. It's, it seemed common sense in a way to protest in that manner, in a way that it mightn't have you know, 30 years later uh, when far less people are involved in trade unions and so on. But in terms of popular culture, I mean, one thing I find is that when people look back they'll kind of make the assumption that the newspapers then were essentially must be the same as the newspapers now and that maybe the North got relatively little coverage or that people didn't talk about it or that it was all censored, you know. Um, and I suppose what's um, interest, what was interesting for me was newspapers like the Sunday World, which is launched in 1973 and rapidly becomes the biggest selling Sunday newspaper in the state. And that had extensive Northern coverage. I mean, the Sunday World interviewed the IRA, it interviewed loyalists, it, you know, reported from on conditions in Lankesh. It also then was a very harsh critic of the coalition government's security policy, protested about censorship, had the inside story on conditions in Port Leash prison, um, and was very much an oppositional, took a very much oppositional tone. And I think people today maybe find that surprising. The Sunday World was always a very populist paper. You know, it had, pinups, you know, had extensive sports coverage, kind of shock horror stories, but took itself very seriously and by 1977 was really a thorn in the side of the coalition government. Sunday Independent, which again today for people would, would probably seem surprising, 1976 the Sunday Independent serialises Michael Farrell's The Orange State, you know, which is very much an, an anti-imperialist critique of the history of Northern Ireland, over three issues, you know, publishes expert excerpts from it and then has John Hume, the Unionist John Taylor, and others come in to give their version of, of, their, of Farrell's book. It also carries a, a big exclusive interview with members of the IRA Army Council in 1976 as well. So to assume that the papers weren't covering the North or that they were cowed by censorship, I think, is, is wrong because the RTE is, is a separate matter. But the po local press in the 1970s outside of Dublin 60 or 70 percent of those who bought a daily paper would also buy their their local paper and all the local papers covered the north because the north always impinged in some way so whether it's refugees in cork whether it's collections for northern solidarity in galway whether it's the border counties or whether it's simply reacting to the latest atrocity you'll get a lot from the coverage of of the local press as well it's incomplete because how do you assess what people think on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, I've tried to look at opinion polls, tried to look at, obviously, voting figures, which are also incomplete because, you know, not elections don't necessarily always reflect what people think about the North. Um, the local press, the letters columns in the local press, debates at trade union conferences, debates within the GAA and so on. I mean, what I tried to do was t to get a, a grip on the popular view of this um, and, and how it did impact on people. And I think it unquestionably did have a major impact on, on Southern life. And there's good news that your book is coming out on paperback. Can you tell us when, when that's coming out? Thankfully, the book will be out in paperback in, in September and hopefully a bit more accessible. Okay. Brian, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.